right. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody, to the fourth Azure Cash Redis community stand-up. Sorry for some technical difficulties there. We're getting started late, but we have plenty of good content. So I'll go ahead and pull up my slides. All right, today we're going to talk a little bit about Azure Cache Redis and OpenAI, which of course is a really popular topic. Uh, and the really good news is that there's some really cool things you can do with Redis and with OpenAI. Uh, and as always, kind of the ground rules, first of all, feel free to ask questions in the chat. We'll address those either in the chat itself or on the call. And then uh, always feel free to reach out to us at Azure Cache PM at Microsoft.com. If you have questions, comments, feature suggestions, we're always excited to hear from you. So with that, let's get it kicked off. So odds are you've heard a lot about AI and the various things that are going on in the space. A lot of really exciting things with Copilot and ChatGPT. And it's obviously a Cambrian explosion of new technologies and tools and opportunities. So there's a ton of hype. A lot of it is justified. But how do you actually make that a reality? What actually goes into using AI in your applications and making it solve business or consumer needs. And you might see this tweet, it's been around for a while that a lot of AI is written in PowerPoint, not in Python. And so how do we actually get into the Python, into the real code using real Azure products and make this a reality? So our goal for today is a simple application that is an AI powered movie recommendation app. So my goal with this is to be able to input a description of a plot. So in this case, spaceships, aliens, and heroes saving America. Great plot. And then get a recommendation for a movie whose plot matches that input. So in this case, Independence Day, the thematic classic from 1995 would be a great answer to this uh, query. And then I want to be able to have a score to tell me how similar the plot of that movie is to my input. And the way all of this works is with an AI concept called embeddings. So the way to think of it is basically you can take almost anything and run it through an AI model. So in this case, we're running a query through the model, spaceships, aliens, and heroes saving America. That goes through the model and that can be a black box. You know, there's all sorts of research and development that's be done to uh, develop that neural net and all the AI going on there. And we get an output, which is a vector. And in our case, we're using the text embedding ADA 002 model, which is the newest one uh, on OpenAI. And that has 1,536 dimensions, meaning 1,536 different scalar values in the vector. And the way to think of that is, it's basically a 1536 dimensional vector. And the value of each of those dimensions is the uh, strength or the, the ma uh, magnitude of that vector. And there's not really an intuitive way to understand what those vectors mean. But you can kind of think of it as each dimension is like a different thing that the model is triggering on. So, um, you know, there's kind of an example there below in that image on the bottom right. This would be a two-dimensional vector, or not a 1,500-dimensional vector, but a two-dimensional vector. You might have one vector that's triggering on the concept of spaceships and another vector that's triggering on the concept of America. And the cool thing about this is that some movies, like for instance, Star Trek True, might have a lot of spaceships, but not a lot of America. And some movies like the movie Lincoln uh, with Daniel Day-Lewis might be very heavy on America, but very low on spaceships. Not a lot of spaceships in the movie Lincoln. And the movie Independence Day might have a little bit of both. And so what this allows us to do is to compare vectors because we have all of these different vectors that are being run through the same model in the same vector space. And we can compare the distance between those vectors. So something like the vector for spaceships, aliens, and heroes saving America might have a high magnitude for both spaceships and America. And the movie Independence Day might have a similarly high magnitude for both of those vectors. And we can compare the distance between those vectors so that we can tell that, for instance, the 
angle between the vector for the movie Independence Day might be a lot closer to our query vector than it would be to the movie Star Trek II or the movie Lincoln, right? So basically the way to think of all of this is that we have this magical AI tool that will categorize almost anything. It could be text, could be a query, could be a single word, could be a video clip or audio or an image. And then because it's being standardized in this vector form, we can compare those vectors and find similarity. There's a lot of different ways to compare the vectors, which we'll dive a little bit into, um, right? Cosine or just the angle between the vectors is maybe the most common, but there's a few others as well. You can measure like the absolute distance or Euclidean distance, for example. Um, and then it raises some extra questions like, okay, well, how do we store these vectors and how do we compare the vectors and make that fast and efficient and quick? And so this is what we're going to go through today. We're going to use this concept and the tools we have available through Azure OpenAI to basically implement this with our movie data set. And we're going to compare vectors and find, given our query vector, what's the closest movie plot vector to that? All right. So let me go ahead and keep going, and then uh, we can come back to this if there's any questions. Okay, so the good news about doing all this is that there's a lot of libraries available that makes this much more straightforward than you might think. So our workflow here is gonna, we're going to start with a data set from Kaggle, which is a great source for various different data sets. We're going to use pandas to clean and ingest that data. And then we're going to use Langchain, which is a, a AI framework that makes plug and play of different components much easier. So we're going to use Langchain to take that data, ingest it, and then use both Azure OpenAI service to generate embeddings and Azure Cache to Redis to store those embeddings vectors and compare them. And Langchain is going to handle all of that integration so we don't have to worry too much about what those interfaces look like. And then finally, to make an application that's looks pretty, we're gonna use Streamlit, which is this great service all in Python to make a really quick and effective UI. All right, and then we're gonna put all of this into Azure as one can imagine and, and run it at the very end. All right, so let's get started. So the first step of course is our data. And obviously for any machine learning application, the data is really critical. So I picked a data set from Kaggle that is a data set of movie plots from Wikipedia. So if you go on Wikipedia, you look up a movie, often it has a section talking about the plot. And so this aggregates about 34,000 different movies from the early 1900s up to 2017, so pretty recent. And so you can see just an example there. These are the first items in the set, in the table, right? There's some pretty old movies, uh, Terrible Teddy and The Grizzly King is a, an interesting movie. I'm curious to know what the, that one's about. And we're going to use the column that has plot data. So that's going to be what we're generating our plot embeddings on. And the other good thing about this is that there's a bunch of metadata here around the cast and the genre and the year of release, et cetera. So we can use that metadata to pre-filter and also filter the data after it's all in embedding format. So that gives us some tools to make things a little more tight. All right, so the first step take our data and ingest it and clean it. So we have our data in a CSV format from Kaggle. It's really easy in Pandas to ingest that into a Pandas data frame. And if you've never used Pandas before, I like to compare it to, it's kind of like the Excel for Python, which would irritate both Pandas users and also Excel users, I think, but it's great. It's kind of like, kind of like your little spreadsheet within uh, Python. All things to say, it allows for really easy ways to filter and clean your data. You know, you can move columns around, rename things. So in our case, what we're going to do is we're actually going to filter by language and by year. And the goal of doing this is just to limit our data set, make it a little easier to work with, and to make it a little cheaper to generate all of these embeddings. So we're going to take just films from the US, UK, and Canada, basically English language films. And then we're going to clean the data. We're going to remove extra spaces. We're going to change some... Um, column names so that it's easier to parse, et cetera, et cetera. And all this is really easy to do within Pandas. All right, the next step is to generate our embeddings. So 
Uh, what we're going to do is, is we're going to use the Azure OpenAI service, which is, as it sounds, a managed OpenAI service on Azure. So all the nice models and, and the power of OpenAI, but on Azure. Um, so you can use all your familiar DevOps tools and run it all on a virtual network, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's a bunch of models for OpenAI, and there's more all the time. We're going to use the text embeddings ADA 002 model, which, as I mentioned before, is kind of the latest embeddings model. So that's the one that's recommended to use right now. By the time you watch this, there might be a new one. So make sure to check. And it's really easy to set all this up with Langchain, which is super nice. So what we can do is we can uh, use the OpenAI embeddings object in Langchain and basically just put in our connection string information. <clears throat> and that creates this embeddings model. And so that allows us really quickly to set this up. We're all ready to go. And the cool thing here too is if you don't want to use Azure OpenAI, for instance, you want to use Llama or one of the you know, various other ML models, it's easy in Lang changes to swap them out. So instead of using your OpenAI embeddings model, you can import your other embeddings model and use that instead. So for example, OpenAI doesn't support image embeddings yet, um, but other models do. So you can swap that in if you're using images rather than text for your vector similarity application. All right, so we put in our connection information. And then our next step is to get a vector database. So we need some place to store these vectors and then also some place to compare the vectors. And I should say that you don't have to compare vectors in the same place you store them, but it's really nice if you can because it makes compute more efficient and makes everything faster. And so Redis happens to have that capability, which is very useful. So if you're not familiar with Redis, it's a great, great tool. It's open source software. It's an in-memory data store and cache. And it's really popular, been around for about 10 years, and largely because it's extremely fast. It runs all in memory, great API and instruction set. Right. It's a good thing to use. The cool thing is Azure offers a managed version of Redis called Azure Cache for Redis, which includes all the Redis features, adds a few more. So things like geo-replication and um, reliability and availability guarantees, automatic failover, cool stuff. So it's, it's kind of more designed for production and, and enterprise usage. And then we also have support for Redis Enterprise on Azure Cache for Redis. Redis Enterprise is like a more advanced version of Redis. It has things like the search capability and JSON capabilities and active geo-replication. And so we, we offer those more advanced features as well on Azure Cache for Redis all a part of the same Azure platform. And so that's where a lot of the vector search capabilities come in. So the, there's a module, it's part of Redis stack called Redis search that has really extensive vector search capabilities, you know, different indexing methods and search metrics and a lot of really rich support for hybrid queries as well. So that's what we're going to be using here um, with our application. So Redis, great option for a vector database. There's a few other on Azure as well, but we're using Redis in this case because it's really easy and has great integrations. And so many people already use Redis in their application. It's really easy and, and often cost effective to use Redis as a vector store as well. So that's what we're going to do. And I mentioned it, it's easy to integrate Redis with Langchain, and that's because uh, people have done a lot of work on the Langchain side to make this integration easy. And so in this case, what I'm doing is I'm first loading that data frame that I have, right? So our, our embeddings data, so the, like the CSV and the pandas data frame, I'm loading that into Langchain in just a couple lines of code. And then I'm creating my, uh, basically forming a Redis URL. So I'm referencing my Redis instance running on Azure. And then I basically just run a function to load all of the, the data frame data into Langchain, generate embeddings on that data, and then save that all to my Redis instance. So it's all on that, that Redis vector store from documents function. So that does all sorts of things behind the scenes for us, which makes our lives really easy. So when I run this code, it'll take you know five to six minutes, basically. Run through all the data, generate our embeddings, load it in Redis, and we're good to go. All right. So once we have all of this data within Redis uh, and all kind of loaded into Langchain, we can run queries. So there's a couple different functions that allow us to run different types of queries. 
In this case, we're running a similarity search with a score, which kind of gives us a, a readout on how close things are. So for instance, this is example, if I search for alien spaceships and heroes saving America, we get back the movie Independence Day and then our vector distance, which in this case, vector distance, the smaller, the better. So it's, it's fairly small, shows us it's a good match. That's our, our top match. And you can also filter on metadata, right? So in this case, I'm choosing to filter based on genre. And there's, again, in Langchain, built-in filters for this using that rich capability in Redis search. And so in this case, I'm saying, all right, I just want comedy movies with that same query. And the result changes. Independence Day, while a great movie, is not a comedy. Maybe kind of a comedy, but not really a comedy. And so this gives us a different movie, the movie Remote Control, which I think is from the 80s. Uh, and you can see that the distance is a little bit further. So it's not quite as good because we're filtering the results, um, but it's the best comedy option that we have available. So this is all just to kind of show that there's a lot of rich things we can do in not that much code, all using AI in the background. Uh, and so before I move on, let me actually just go ahead and, and share some VS code here just to kind of show you what that looks like. So let me go ahead and share my screen. One second. Okay. All right. All right, cool. So here's an example. This is the Jupyter Notebook that I took these code snippets from. And this is all available. We have a link at the end to a repo uh, with all this code. And we have a tutorial as well that basically walks you through this step-by-step -step that's on our docs right now. So if you want to actually get your hands dirty and try this using the Jupyter Notebook, you are absolutely welcome to do so. So you can see what I did, really. Just installing the different libraries, importing those libraries. Here's where I'm loading in the data frame, right? It's just a couple lines. You can see the all these films. You know, there, and there's stuff that we filtered out later, like these Turkish movies. Filter, uh, filter that. Uh, so here's our filtering, and then uh, this is removing the spaces and extra line characters, etc. And, and here we could actually calculate the number of tokens required to generate embeddings on all this. So it, it took uh, about seven million tokens, and I, I forget how much that costs. It's on our page. I think that costs about fifty cents. Here's where we're loading our data frame into Langchain. So again, really similar. We're specifying which column we're using as our embedding generation. You're using the plot column. And then here's where we're generating our embeddings. Not a good practice to have the, the login information actually in, uh, in plain text, but I'll rotate this after the demo. So don't do that, but this is here just to, for sake of convenience. And then this function here is what's generating the invectors and storing those into Redis. Awesome. So let me go ahead. Let me just reload everything here since it's a Jupyter Notebook. And then here's an example, right? So if I search for uh, the query dogs playing basketball, I want a movie about dogs playing basketball. It gives us this movie Basketball, which was a flop from the mid 90s. Uh, and it's, you know, it's not a bad uh, return here, but that's not actually the, the one I'm looking for. Right? Dogs playing basketball is a really broad search term. So there's a lot of movies that come up all with kind of a similar search. They're a similar vector distance. So if I if I switch the genre to family in this case, we get the movie Airbud, which maybe is, is the movie I'm looking for. And if we make this more specific, right? So if we say, instead of dogs playing basketball, we say, um, uh, let's see, like a dog learns to play basketball with a young boy and defeats an evil clown, which if you've seen Airbud, actually is part of the plot. So we'll see if, if this extra detail in the query gives us a more accurate vector search with our movies vectors. So I don't know. Well, I haven't tried this. We'll see. Yeah. So I get Airbud in that case. So more specific query on the plot gives us a more specific answer. And you can see that the, the, the vector distance went down. So this is kind of how the, the vector search works. Awesome. All right. So again, this is all available uh, for you to try out yourself. Obviously, highly encourage that. All right. Let me run back to my slides. Okay. Back to the slides. 
Cool. So the next step is to add a user interface. So uh, if you've never heard of Streamlit, it was new to me as well. It was a fun thing. It basically is a really, really easy framework to create a rich and, and in many cases, powerful user experience. It's all in Python. So if you're like me and prefer Python, it's a really great way to get started. Uh, it has a pretty wide range of elements as well. So you, you can have a lot of control over how the UI looks. The downside is that you can't customize it that much, right? So if you're used to playing a lot with CSS and making things look a particular way, eh, maybe less of an option, but it's a great way to, to build the framework of an application and try it really easily with a user experience. Uh, and again, since it's all in Python, makes it very easy to deploy. So in this case, I created a really basic application with Streamlit. You can see what that looks like here. It's literally uh, just a few lines of code for the UI itself, right? The rest of the code takes some more, um, but it's a great way to get started. And then what I can do is include all of this into a container and deploy that into Azure Container Apps. So this way, everything is running natively on Azure. So I got my Azure OpenAI service and Azure Cache Redis, which are standalone applications. And then the, the data and all the Python code, including the UI, can all be part of Azure Container Apps. And so that's what I did. So let me demo what this looks like, and I'm going to share my screen again. OK. I can find my web browser. Nope, not that one. One second. Okay, here we go. All right. Boom, there we go. Okay, so this is what I did. This is uh, just a resource group with all the resources I have. I got my um, OpenAI service, my Azure Cache Redis instance, and then my container app. And uh, basically the containers deployed uh, here in the registry. There's some great commands to do this all automatically. It makes it easy. So uh, that's documented in the repo. But if I go to my container app, um, it's easy, it's publicly accessible. I can just go to my URL that's automatically generated. Close the old ones, and then we have this application. So this is all in Streamlit. Uh, you can see that I can have my search bar here. I can filter the number of results I get, and then additional filters here as part of that hybrid search. So if I search for, uh, what was it? Um, spaceships, aliens, and heroes saving America, capitalize America. And let's say I want five results across all genres and run a search. Uh-oh. Here, we'll do, it may have not returned enough things. Okay, until it's a live demo. All right, so here's our, here's our example. So our top result is Independence Day. And we pull the, the poster there. And actually didn't find that many results. It's filtering in this case by default on a certain cutoff, which is interesting. So anyway, so our like second query here, number two option is the movie Solar Crisis that is from 1990. Interesting. All right, so I can search for, here, let me try, try this again. I search for a few more results. Okay, yeah, so expanding the number of results, you see that there's extra movies here that are pretty close. This is a similarity score where the higher number is better. So movies like Invaders from Mars trigger on a lot of these keywords from 1986. Extra Genesis by James Cameron, which I am not familiar with. And I can filter this as well. So if I choose, for instance, um, let's, let's do comedy. Huh. It's kind of weird. I'll try animated. Let's see what comes up here. Yeah, so if I do an animated movie, we get the movie Brave Star, the complete series, which looks quite interesting and not familiar with that. And a variety of other options here as well. So the similarity score is lower, which means it's further away, but I can choose certain animated movies. And I also can filter by year. So if I wanna say, 
I only want a movie that meets that criteria from 2017. Let me search there. Gives us Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets, which I've never watched, but is very much a space opera type movie, which makes sense. Also, Transformers is another option here. That's our number four option. But you can see as I filter more things, the score drops more and more. And that's just because as we filter out certain genres and categories, the vectors just aren't quite as similar, right? They're, they're pretty good, but not quite as similar. So that's just a kind of example here. If you have any suggestions of what I should search for, feel free to put that in the chat. Uh, it's an interesting movie database. Awesome. So this is just a good example of, of what all this looks like in a simple application. Like I said, it is available in the repo, so feel free to give it a shot. Okay, let me run back to my slides. Cool. So beyond doing something for movie buffs, there are a lot of practical applications for vector, vector similarity search, right? Uh, so one is visual search. This was all done using text, but you can search images as well. So you can imagine an, a, a website or an e-commerce site where you have a pair of shoes that you really like and you want something that looks similar to those pairs of shoes. Well, you can use an image-based vector search to find similar images uh, or similar items in the product catalog. So great example there. Semantic search maybe is the main use case we see customers use for this, which is like, so an example basically is, um, let's say that you're a company and you have a really complicated healthcare plan coverage document. I know Microsoft does, uh, or really anything, any internal documentation, for example. You can upload that document to Azure, chunk it into different chunks of data, store that within Azure Cache for Redis, and then do a similarity search on that data. So I can ask, what's my healthcare coverage for mental health? The vector search will find the most relevant paragraph of information within your own document. And then you can use uh, language models like GPT 3.5, for instance, to summarize that data. So basically you can kind of create your own chat GPT using your own data using vector similarity search and other AI models from OpenAI to summarize that data. Uh, you know, other examples are like more of a basic Q&A example or even expanding existing GPT functionality to use vector search to, for instance, store past queries. And then another example is recommendation, right? So uh, comparing similar searches is a good example here. You know, if it's an e-commerce site and I'm searching for whatever, blue children's uh, swimming pools, for instance. Well, the vector similarity of that query is much closer to something like, um, you know, a, a child, a, a other children's toys or a child swimsuit, for instance. And so you can look at past queries and recommend future queries based on the vector similarity. So it's just a really great way to compare things that don't have any words in common, but have semantic meaning in common. Uh, and there's a lot of use cases for recommendation across businesses and applications there. One other thing I'll mention here is that we, um, another great use case for Azure Cache Redis is as a semantic cache. So running a query on an LLM can be kind of expensive, right? If it's generating like a paragraph of text, for example, that's a lot more expensive than running the vector uh, embeddings on just a question. There's a car alarm going off in the background. So apologies if you hear that. So what you can do is you can basically say, I want to cache common queries. And it makes a little bit of sense, right? If I ask the exact same question with the exact same words, you could, you could cache the response from an LLM. But what if I ask slightly different questions? Well, in that case, the cache wouldn't necessarily trigger. And you would pay the full amount of money to regenerate basically the same response. But using vector similarity, you actually can intelligently detect how close is the meaning of the question, not the exact text of the question, and then cache responses based on meanings. So an example here is I could ask an LLM, tell me a joke, and then I get a response. And I could cache that question, tell me a joke, and return the same joke every time a different user asks that question. But if someone else asks, please tell me a joke, I wouldn't have it cached because the exact query isn't quite the same. 
But if you do a semantic caching approach, where you compare the vectors of those two queries together, you'll quickly find that the query, please tell me a joke, is almost identical to the query, tell me a joke. And then you can return the same response, saving both time and money. So there's also Langchain integrations to do that really straightforwardly. That'll likely be available in a future video. So stay tuned for that. And I do want to respond to a question from Drezy. Uh, let me see if I can show this. Does Azure have a vector database with Azure documentation? The answer to that is yes. So um, there's some links at the end of this spread, or, uh, slideshow with documentation, both a step-by-step -step tutorial and also documentation that's more conceptual about using vector databases on Azure and Azure Cache Redis in particular. So look for that. Hopefully that answers your question. OK, just a few more slides. So I wanted to mention some good news on this as well. If you've used Azure Cache Redis before for vector similarity, the biggest complaint is not performance. The biggest complaint is price. And so we just released some new SKUs, including our E5 SKU that cuts the price in half. So it's a smaller cache, but half the price. And so that's a great way to get started um, in more dev test scenarios, for instance, or just if you don't need to cache as much data, it's a more cost effective option. So wanted to mention that to folks here, uh, if cost has been holding you back, this might be a way to get around that problem. Awesome. And then going into next steps. So I mentioned we have a lot of examples of, um, of repos with code and also tutorials. So I wanted to mention a few of those here. So uh, the first link is a repo to the exact code that I went through, both, both the Jupyter Notebook and also the Streamlit app itself. So there's a container you can deploy today if you'd like. So look at the GitHub page for that. And then we have a couple different examples. Um, so one is a, a real world semantic Q&A application where just like I said, you can upload your own documents and then you can uh, do kind of a Q&A, like a chat bot using semantic queries on that document. And then another example that is similar as well. It's a little more stripped down, but another great example of doing this kind of vector search on your own data. Uh, and that has a Jupyter notebook and uses a different uh, language framework if you don't want to use Langchain. And then the second to last link is a tutorial that kind of walks you step by step through this example to show you what it looks like to load all your libraries, to get the data, et cetera, et cetera. So a great place to start if you're brand new to this. And then as Andresi mentioned, we do have documentation as well on using Azure Cache Redis as a vector database. So uh, that all lives in our docs. It's pretty much brand new. So feel free to check that out and learn about the latest there. OK. And then our last slide, just a quick thank you. Uh, you know, some useful links here for our other community standups. We do this basically once a, once a month. And like I said before, you are always free to reach out if you have any questions or you'd like any updates. So I'll pause here just for a second. If you have questions, feel free to put those in the chat. Uh, if not, please reach out. Uh, like I said, we do these all the time. We will have a future one of these sessions focusing on different aspects of using Azure Cache or Redis with Azure OpenAI, including semantic caching, as well as a couple other applications. So there's a lot of things to do here, uh, a lot of exciting opportunities, and we're really excited to see what you do use uh, and do with this moving forward. All right, I don't see any questions. Uh, if you have anything, again, reach out and we'll talk to you all soon. Thank you so much for coming to our stand up and we hope you have a great day. Thank you.